Well, thank you so much uh, to, uh, to both uh, Eric and, and Joseph for the invitation to be here. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, so, so, so uh, um, as was mentioned, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Latham Boyle. I'm primarily a physicist, primarily a cosmologist, but I have this longstanding um, side interest in um, the Penrose tiling, which I'll introduce, and objects like it, and uh, their applications in physics, which I want to tell you about. Um, and, uh, oops, my, I'm sorry, my, my, I'll have to keep an eye on my iPad, which is logging me out too quickly. Um, yeah, so, uh, so I want to tell you, basically introduce you to the Penrose tiling. Uh, 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 if you don't know much about it, uh, explain why it's, uh, first of all, interesting to physicists and mathematicians alike. Um, and then I want to discuss how uh, two, two ways that it shows up uh, in physics uh, beyond the sort of standard, there's a standard application which has already received a Nobel Prize in 2011 um, to describing quasi-crystals, but then there are two uh, more recent applications, one to uh, systems which are scale invariant, which, uh, uh, which come up a lot in physics, and, uh, and then uh, secondly, uh, at the end, more briefly, I want to discuss uh, quasi-crystals in Lorentzian settings, where, in other words, where the signature is, where the in, in, in a space-time that has a time direction in addition to spatial directions, and in particular, a special example of this that uh, which might be of interest to physics. I'll give some. Uh, I'll give some uh, uh, admittedly speculative arguments about what, what, what why, why it might be interesting. But in any case, I think it's mathematically interesting also. OK. So I, again, uh, for starters, I just want to introduce you to the Penrose tiling. And uh, to introduce the Penrose tiling, uh, it's, it's nice to start with a, um, I'll turn on my highlighter here. Sorry, we were so busy getting, the, uh, getting all the, uh, is that a good color? No. Um, how about that? OK. Um, I was so busy. Uh, Getting the slides working, I forgot to get my highlighter set up. Sorry about that. So, um, so there is a famous theorem that if you have a pattern with translational symmetry, then uh, it only has points with two, three, four, or six-fold symmetry. You don't find any other points of you don't find points of five-fold symmetry or seven-fold symmetry, etc. So what I'm so you know to, to here I have two famous you know patterns that you're all familiar with, and you can see all the examples of allowed symmetries already appearing here. So, you know if you look at the midpoint of any edge on the square tiling or on the hexagonal tiling, you know a t uh, rotation by uh, half of a turn is a symmetry. It carries the tiling into itself. So that's what I mean by twofold symmetry, uh, uh, or it's a vertex uh, in the square tiling. Or the center of any square is a point of fourfold symmetry, and over here on the hexagonal tiling, the vertices where three hexagons meet is a point of threefold rotational symmetry. The center of every hexagon is a point of sixfold rotational symmetry, and the theorem is that those are the only types of symmetries that can appear. And uh, so here's a I've sketched a little proof at the bottom of what's going you know, to help understand what's going on of why points of fivefold symmetry can't appear. Okay, so. So at the bottom here, suppose we have you know one point of fivefold symmetry, this purple guy on the bottom left. Uh, then, well, if it's a translationally invariant pattern, that can't just be one point of fivefold symmetry because there's all the translations of that of that of that point have to be present as well. And so, in particular, suppose you take two points of uh, that you know suppose that there's some finite minimum separation between uh, uh, nearest neighbor points of fivefold symmetry, and let let these be. To an example of two such nearest neighbor uh, points of fivefold symmetry. Well, then the purple guy uh, sees a, a blue five over to the right, but then it also has to see a you know two pi over five away from that. If it's a point of fivefold symmetry, it also has to see another point of fivefold symmetry up here. But you can make the same argument from standing at the blue five that if it sees a, a purple five off to the left, it also has to see a purple five prime up here. But then we've, we've therefore argued that, there, that these two points also have to be points of fivefold symmetry, but they're now closer together than the initial pair we started with, which by hypothesis was a nearest neighbor pair.
pair, and so we have a contradiction. So, uh, yeah, so, 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 you, so you can't have points of five-fold symmetry. Um, and uh, so the same argument you, you'll find will go through for any type of symmetry except for these, these four possibilities that are allowed. Is this just 2D, or, or does that generalize to? Uh, it actually does generalize to higher to higher dimensions, although uh, it, there's a subtle. But 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 that, but but basically that's right because ba basically the argument goes through because if you you know uh, uh, if you have a point of, of fivefold symmetry, you can just focus on the plane in which it acts um, and make the argument in that plane. Um, okay, so uh, now. There was a question mathematicians were interested in of whether you could find tilings that had the property that they tiled the plane without any gaps or overlaps, but only did so in a, in a pattern that was non-periodic, that had no translational symmetries. You couldn't find any vectors by which you could translate the pattern, and it would be exactly carried into itself. Um, and there were uh, earlier uh, mathematicians in the 60s and 70s that found uh, the initial examples uh, of such tilings with uh, many tiles, but then there was a famous, the most famous uh, uh, and a very beautiful example was discovered by Penrose in the 70s, this Penrose tiling, which I'm showing here. Um, and uh, I, I actually, it's usually called the Penrose tiling. I, 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 I tend to call it the Amon Penrose tiling because my understanding is that it was actually co-discovered by this guy Amon, uh, who was not a uh, academic, he was a sort of amateur mathematician, but uh, well, let, let me just say, so, so uh, in the early days, right after the discovery of the Penrose tiling, it turned out to have, in addition to having this desired property that it only tiles non-periodically, it turned out to have all sorts of other miraculous and interesting properties, and so it became very interesting to mathematicians. Uh, and uh, in particular, these four people, Robert Amon, Roger Penrose, John Conway, and De Bruyne, uh, it, in the first year, couple of years after the discovery of the tiling made a lot of the very fundamental discoveries uh, about it um, and about tilings like it. And uh, the bottom three, Penrose, Conway, and De Bruyne are, are well-known mathematicians. Uh, I, I just want to say a, a, a word about Amon here because he's, he's less well-known. Um, so yeah, he, he, was a, he was a computer programmer and then worked as a mail sorter in the post office but he was a, apparently kind of eccentric, reclusive guy. But really, uh, the genius of, I mean, he, he, in addition to independently discovering this tiling, he discovered the other most famous tilings of, of this class and also discovered a lot of the most de sort of deepest and most interesting properties of these tilings. So he really deserves a lot of the credit um, for, for discoveries in this area. Um, he unfortunately died young and he never published papers on tilings himself. Actually, two, two other mathematicians wrote, a, wrote up some of his results and put his name on the paper. But, um, but we know about what he did because he wrote articles to Martin Gardner, who wrote a column for Scientific American. He, he wrote letters to Martin Gardner, and, and we know what he found from his letters, and some of which some of the discoveries were reported then by Martin Gardner. But, um, but there's a nice, I recommend, there's a nice uh, biographical article by uh, Marjorie Seneschal called The Mysterious Mr. Amon. And, in particular, I, when I read that article, she referred to that he did actually write, one, she did try to write one paper, uh, but it was not about tilings, and he, he, tr he sent it to Nature, and it wasn't published, it, they, they, Nature wouldn't consider it, but he gave a copy of it to Marjorie Sh Seneschal, and I asked her to send me a copy, and so I have this precious scan of, of, of a copy of the paper that she dug up in, uh, with mold on it from, the, from her back, uh, from, from the storage uh, area in her backyard, and uh, you, you can see what it's about here. So it's called an unorthodox explanation of the Cretaceous tertiary boundary event. So it looks at first glance like a very uh, standard letter to nature, but if you kind of, uh, anyway, you read a little bit, I can send it to anyone who's interested, but it's, it's a theory of the dinosaur extinction that they, arguing, giving various bits of indirect evidence that they got very intelligent very quickly and then blew themselves up in a nuclear uh, war. <laughs> so it's, it's an alternative explanation for the, uh, for the uh, radioactive layer that's, that's normally interpreted as, as, as evidence of, a, of, an, of an asteroid impact, et cetera. Um, okay, so anyway, he's a, so he was an interesting fellow. That's all I wanted to say. Good. So to, to continue with the introduction to the Penrose tiling, um, 
I uh, just wanted to introduce you to uh, sort of three different ways to uh, think about it or look at it or create it or construct it. So here is, here is the first way, so a so-called inflation rule. Okay, so, the, so, so there are these two basic tiles, a thin uh, rhombus, the blue rhombus, and a, and, a, and a fatter rhombus, the red rhombus. And so the first rule, the, the, this, this, way, this way of constructing the tiling is just, you know, you, you, you construct it by an iterative substitution rule. Every time you see a blue diamond, you replace it, you, you, you kind of uh, grow it by a, by a factor of the golden ratio and then replace it by a pattern of red and blue diamonds like this, or every time you see a red diamond, you, cr you replace it by a pattern like this. Okay, and so here's the first few steps of an iteration. You start with these five guys, you apply the substitution once, you get this pattern, you, you apply the substitution again, you get this next one, and you keep going, and in the limit you generate an infinite patch of tiles, which is uh, one way to get um, uh, 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 an example of the Penrose tiling. Um, okay, here's another way, sometimes called the cut and project or model set approach to producing uh, the tiling. So here I've shown, uh, uh, here I'm showing a lower dimensional analogous example. So th how does this cut and project method work? Well, you start, so here for example, I'm starting in, I I'm gonna produce a, I'm gonna produce a one dimensional analog of the Penrose tiling. Okay, an, an, a non-repeating sequence, a non-periodic sequence of two tiles, a long tile and a short tile like this one. So I get a long, short, long, long, short, long, short, et cetera. Um, and so how do, I, how do I get this 1DA periodic sequence? Well, I start from this higher dimensional lattice, periodic lattice, and then I take a square in the lattice and I slide it along, which is what this or orange, orange stripe is. And the key point is that I slide it along a line of irrational slope. You can convince yourself that if I slid it along, okay, I slide it along this, this, this line of, uh, of irrational slope, and then the rule of the game is that every time I find a point in the lattice that lies within that orange band, I orthogonally project it onto the line, and that's how I get my aperiodic sequence. And uh, you, you, you can see that if you, if you took a rational slope, you would get a periodic sequence by this algorithm. But an irrational slope, you'll get a sequence that, that has no translational symmetry, you can, if you think about it. And in particular here, to get, a, to get this, this is a famous 1D quasi-crystal called the Fibonacci tiling or Fibonacci sequence. Um, and uh, to get this one, you, 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 you take a particular slope, which is one over the golden ratio. But the Penrose tiling itself is, can be produced by a very analogous um, process, but you just double all the dimensions. So instead of starting with a two-dimensional lattice, you start with the A4 root lattice, a kind of particularly symmetrical lattice in four dimensions. And then instead of taking a one-dimensional line through it, you take a two-dimensional plane along some particularly symmetrical slice. Um, but other than that, the, the game is the same, and, and that's, that's another way to get the, the uh, Penrose tiling. Okay, and yet here's, a, here's yet another way that was discovered by Amon. Okay, so if you, so here again, um, so, so if, you, if you ignore the blue lines here for starters and just look at the purple lines, it's just another copy of the Penrose tiling. Okay, so the purple lines form, you know, uh, you just see, you'll just see fat, fat tiles and, and thin rhombuses. Um, and if you look at now, so what, what, are, what are the blue lines? Well, uh, if you look at any particular fat rhombus, like this one, for example, if you look at any two of them, so this one maybe and this one. If you look at the pattern of blue lines on them, you'll see they, it's exactly the same decoration of the tile. And similarly, if you look at any two thin rhombuses, for example, this one and this one, uh, again, you'll see that the pattern of blue lines, uh, the decoration is exactly the same. So you, so you have these two tiles with these two specific blue decoration by blue line segments. But now the rules of the game are that you can construct the tiling by saying, okay, I, I'm, I'm gonna lay out those tiles, um, but I'm only allowed to put two tiles next to each other if the, if the segments, if the blue line segments on the adjacent tiles join up into straight, into a straight blue line. So, you know, you see, you see, the, you see the, the blue lines here just form infinite straight lines with no breaks in them um, if, I put, if I put them together in, in the right uh, order. So that's another, rule that forces you to get uh, this, this uh, same basic tiling, the Penrose tiling. These blue lines are sometimes called almond lines or almond bars. Um, 
And uh, yet another way to think about the Penrose tiling is as a kind of dual. There's a, there's a, there's a sense in which if you think of the, if, you just, if I just give you the pattern of blue lines, there's a, there's a natural way to dualize that, that, that pattern to get the pattern of purple lines. Um, but let me not go into that uh, for, for time's sake. Okay, so those are just a few introductory ways to think about this same structure. Um, now the first famous way that it entered in physics was uh, as a mathematical model for quasicrystals. Okay, so what are quasicrystals? Well, you know, if, you, if I give you a hunk of matter, uh, you know, one classic way that a physicist will try to determine what, how the atoms are arranged in the matter is by doing some sort of um, diffraction experiment where they shine something through the matter and then look for, um, look for the diffraction pattern coming as, the, as whatever they shine through comes out the other end. So for example, we could take an x-ray source here, shine x-rays through our hunk of matter, and then as the x-rays come out, you know, instead of just passing straight through, some of them will be deflected off at certain angles, and uh, we'll get some pattern of bright and dark spots on a screen on the other side of the hunk of matter. And if this hunk of matter is a gas or a liquid or some amorphous thing with no particular order to the atoms, um, you know, I'll, I'll just get kind of a cloud here. I won't, I, won't, I won't have any particular structure. But if it's a crystal, I'll find that there are, that there are you know, that instead, you know, the screen ends up being mostly dark, uh, except for, you know, certain very bright spots uh, because of this phenomenon of Bragg diffraction, and those are called Bragg diffraction peaks. Okay, and so the 2011 Nobel Prize was awarded for this discovery of a diffraction pattern like this. Okay, and the, the, the thing that's strange about this diffraction pattern is that if you count the number of dots in a ring here, you'll see there's 10 of them actually. So this, 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 uh, this um, diffraction pattern has a symmetry, 10-fold symmetry, which uh, should be forbidden for a crystal. So in other words, it, it had normally been thought that if you have a diffraction pattern that, that forms these bright Bragg diffraction peaks, that that was the sign that you were looking at a crystal. But now we have a, a crystal, a crystal, quote unquote, that seems to be showing a symmetry to its Bragg diffraction pattern, which should be forbidden uh, for an ordinary, uh, by, by the theorem that I mentioned on the second slide. In other, in, in other words, we should only be able to see Bragg diffraction patterns with two-fold, three-fold, four-fold, or six-fold symmetry. Instead, we're seeing ten-fold symmetry. Um, okay, and so the interpretation is, roughly speaking, that, uh, that the atoms in this, uh, in this material are not arranged in a periodic lattice, but they're arranged in something uh, like a Penrose tiling or a three-dimensional analog of a Penrose tiling. Okay, so that was my... That was my Ultra fast introduction to the Penrose tiling. So now I'm going to. Uh, that's you know. So that's the that's the famous application um, to quasi crystals in the lab. Um, but you know, one of the things I want to get across is that these these Penrose tiles and objects like them are very mathematically beautiful objects. They they have a lot of very special features, and as you know, things like this just have a tendency of turning up. Uh, again, you know, beautiful things sort of want to appear in the world, and uh, and uh, so I think it's like that with with, with, the, with these sorts of tilings. And so I want to discuss two other places, uh, one place where they definitely do turn up, and then another. Anyway, so we'll, we'll get what, what, one place where they turn up, but whether it's actually of physical importance is another matter. But it's anyway fun, and I'll keep it brief at the end, so won't be too much of a waste of your time, even if, even if it turns out to be pure craziness. Um, okay, so. Part one, I, I didn't touch on that, I just noticed it, sorry. Um, so, uh, yeah, so part one, uh, quantum crystals and scale invariants. Okay, so what's the, what's the gist here? Um, so for the past 20 or 25 years, physicists have been uh, very interested in this um, idea of holography, which is that they've, they've, there's a duality that has been discovered that relates uh, a theory, okay, so I should back up and say, what are we looking at here? You know, this is this famous uh, Escher print of angels and demons where it's, it, 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 it's a way of de depicting uh, a tiling of negatively curved hyperbolic space. So in other words, 
neg negatively curved hyperbolic space is really this infinite negatively curved space, but um, a classic way to depict it uh, in the two-dimensional Euclidean plane is to do a conformal mapping that maps it down to a finite disk. So a conformal mapping means that y y the distances can be squashed, but the locally the angles uh, get preserved by the mapping. And so in the real hyperbolic plane, all the angels should be all the same si uh, were really all the same size, and all the demons were all the same size. They're all congruent to one another. But after the mapping, it looks like they get tinier and tinier as you get out towards the boundary the, uh, uh, of the negatively curved space. OK. And the relevance to physics is that in this idea of holography, physicists have discovered that there are two different theories that are secretly appear to be the same, have the same physical content. They appear to be describing the same physics, but in very different ways. And they're dual to one another. Uh, okay, and so the two theories are, there's a, there's a, there's a theory with gravity that lives uh, in the so-called bulk here, in, in, that is to say in the negatively curved hyperbolic space, and then the dual theory is a theory without gravity, but with conformal symmetry, which is a fancy version of saying that it uh, has a symmetry under uh, rescaling lengths um, that lives not inside the hyperbolic space, but at the boundary of the hyperbolic space. And within the past, let's say, 10 years or so, um, people have gotten very interested in the idea of trying to give a discrete formulation of this theory, a discrete formulation of holography, to make contact with, first of all, um, for various reasons. But one of the reasons is that it's increasingly become clear, as people have tried to understand this duality, that aspects of it can be understood in terms of, best understood in terms of quantum information. So, uh, and, and normally quantum information, quantum computing, these things are phrased in, in the discrete language of qubits moving around quantum circuits and their gates and wires that the qubits move along, et cetera. Um, and so people replace the continuous in these attempts to, to, to capture these, these, these aspects of the duality. They tend to replace the um, bulk, the continuous bulk space, by a discretization of the bulk space that retains a lot of the symmetry, an infinite amount of the, an infinite subgroup of, of the original isometry group of the bulk space. And they do that by using a regular tessellation of, of, of the space. Uh, so this is not, the angels and demons aren't yet a regular tessellation. We'll see a regular tessellation uh, in a moment. But uh, in short, uh, so People have been very interested in that, and in fact, people uh, at, at Alberta have been uh, doing all sorts of great work about uh, understanding the physics uh, on, on, uh, on, on a sort of hyperbolic space that's been discretized onto a regular tessellation. Um, and uh, what I want to point out is that uh, it, well, what we pointed out in this paper was that if you then look at what discretization that induces at the boundary, if you want, uh, of the space, it actually discretizes the boundary into an aperiodic tiling like the Penrose tiling. And in fact, you can think of it as, as space as being broken into layers where each, each successive layer is related to the, one, to the previous one and to the next one by a kind of substitution rule, which is just like the sort of inflation rule that produces the Penrose tiling. Um, and, uh, and we have a paper coming out shortly with my student, Justin Culp, uh, that uh, uh, explains how to extend this to uh, higher dimensions, at least in certain cases. Okay, so for starters, I just wanted to explain, so why, why is this happening? What, what, what is it about Penrose tilings that, have any, that, that make them particularly um, relevant to describing systems with scale invariance or conformal invariance? Um, and so it, there's various ways to say it, but for the purposes of a sort of colloquium, I think this one is the easiest, um, which is, you know, okay, so here, what, this, this picture is just showing that, uh, you know, if I start with uh, the pink square tiling here, then there's a simple, of course, local rule for creating a more refined uh, black tiling. I just go to every square and, uh, uh, and split it into four smaller squares. 
uh, and you know, this, it's a local rule. I don't need any global coordination. I could send out a bunch of construction workers to different parts of the tiling and just say, you know, go to your, go to your part of the tiling and just start splitting the splitting the pink squares into smaller black squares, and then maybe maybe tomorrow we'll we'll do it again and make an even more refined tiling. Um, okay, so so far so good. Now. But then the problem arises where if you wanted to go in the opposite direction, if you wanted to start with the black tiling and make a coarser tiling, then you know now if I send the construction workers to, to, to distant places on the tiling and tell them to just start grouping four squares together to make uh, bigger squares, uh, you know they, they don't have enough information to unambiguously decide how to do that. And so the pink guy might start grouping squares like this, and the blue might do this, and the orange might do this. And they're all making incompatible choices, so that as they, so that they're going to run into each other, and and, and there will be defects uh, in, in between each of them that'll form domain walls that'll form. So somehow, it's this picture is supposed to be intrinsically showing that it's an intrinsic consequence of the translational invariance of the black tiling that there's not enough information that it doesn't have, it doesn't know what coarser tiling it came from. Okay, this is just drawing the same thing again. So the, here, I've, so so every step up I go, there's a factor of four additional ambiguity in which, in terms of which tiling I came from. So here, here on top of the refined black tiling, I've drawn two different tilings that are two levels higher, two levels coarser, the blue tiling and the purple tiling. And I, you know, the black tiling could have come from either of these. And there's now, you know, at this level, there's 16 different possibilities. And so it, it just yeah, the, the, the ambiguity grows exponentially, a factor of four at every layer that you course correct. Um, I just want to explain that the, the Penrose tiling, uh, you know, does not suffer from this problem. That uh, if you if you think about what's going on here, so so this is a this is the tiling. This is the picture now of two layers of the Penrose tiling. So the the coarser layer is the purple, the purple guys, and the and the more refined tiling beneath it is the pink lines. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so again, it, 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 the, the, the idea is that you know, every, 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 every fat rhombus here has been split into smaller bits of pink rhombuses uh, in the same way, and every thin rhombus has been split into smaller bits of pink rhombuses in the same way. But now, not only is there an unambiguous local rule that construction you construction workers can use to split tilings up into smaller tilings, but there's also an, an unambiguous local rule that they can use to figure out how to glue tilings together uh, into uh, coarser, bigger tiles. So for example, every time you see this combination where two, where two thin tiles and three uh, fat tiles meet in this particular way, you know you're supposed to draw you know, you're supposed to glue those bits into a larger purple pile, uh, et cetera. So it's completely unambiguous. Yeah? So when you split the, like the, let's say the, the, the thin rhombus, there's, there's two possible choices, right? There's, there's like a random placement on it. This is like the, the, the three lines could branch out of one vertex or on the opposite vertex on the other. Mm -hmm. That's true, yes. So, so that, that, that's a good point. So, so the, so the, so the, uh, so, so, e so each tiling is born that's a good point. So the, each tiling actually is uh, has a kind of labeling to it, which isn't shown in this figure. Sometimes it's drawn as little arrows on the edges. But so that's that's a very there's good like, point. There's like black and white. That's a good uh, skinny rhombus. Yeah, yeah, one way to say it is that you can is that you no, there's only one kind of skinny rhombus. It's just that the orientation is labeled okay. uh, on the rhombus, right. even though I haven't shown that here. But but it, it's important to emphasize that that actually so, so that but that's a, that's a very good. But there's but but still, nevertheless, point. nevertheless, the point the, the point remains that when the, the, the rule the, there's a local rule. So for example, actually, although it's not drawn on the figure here to, to not complicate the figure, that you know, this when I when I originally put down this purple tile, it was born with some arrows on its edges, and those arrows told me when I came along how to split it up into smaller pink guys. But then they also when I do at the at the moment that I split it up that way, I also have put little arrows on their edges. Like or you're also not drawing. Exactly. There's a certain orientation okay. to, the, to the edges. Exactly. Okay. Um, so, and we can't just do that with the periodic? Wait. Yeah. 
Exactly. So, so, so in other words, in other words, there's a, there's an incompatibility. If you think about it, there's going to be an incompatibility with the basic idea that there's translational invariance in the in, in, in the most refined level. Uh, you know, for example, it, it, uh, you'd you'd have to do you, you'd have to do something. It, yeah, exactly. You you can't do it um, because. Uh, because it's fundamentally incompatible with, with translational invariance. The, the point is, if you if you think about the the, the, the more the, the more um, coarse tilings it could have come from, anything that would have distinguished the purple the purple coarser tiling from the blue coarser tiling would have had to been something since those are ultimately just related to one another by a translation of the of the black tiling. Anything that distinguishes between them would have had to been related have had to been some secret breaking of the translational invariance in the but what sounds not so convincing is if you propagate the label in the in row space, you could think you can propagate some labels into the vertex space. I think one difference here, though, is well, that one, one thing. Sorry, oh, oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sure. So there's no um, growth of labels from layer to layer in the Penrose case. That's another. That's another important part of this story. Is that the, is that the net? You know, the idea is that in the Penrose tiling that every layer of the tiling is self-similar. So it's the same two tiles with the same set of labels and the same rule to go below and, and go above. You know, so for example, here you could, you could imagine you know, getting four times as many labels at each, at each secretly living in each tile at every level, but then in some sense you're, it, it, it's, it's saying that the, that the lower level tiles are in some sense much more highly labeled than the higher level ones and they only superficially look the same. Next slide. Yes, that's right. Uh, yeah. Does it mean to use your previous language that each and every tile, if you let yourself construction vertex, each and every one of them has to be an existence of a unique constructions as to how to look at the tile, because otherwise it would be an ambiguity as to which vertex to start from. In this, in, in, sorry, in this, in this case, in this case, no, but in this case, yes. Sorry, sorry. In, in this, maybe I misunderstood your question. In, in this, in this tiling, the construction workers are just told every time you see, uh, every time you see this, um, you know, it, 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 when you're when you're training the construction yeah. workers at the at the at the construction worker training institute, you just tell them you, you teach them you know here every time you see this purple pattern here every time you see this pink pattern here, with two thin guys uh, meeting and uh, and. Uh, uh, with two thin guys meeting, but not adjacently like that, you draw a fat you draw a fat rhombus around it. Oh, oh. You see what I mean? Uh, yeah, no, I misunderstood. And I thought it was the other way around. I thought they were to draw inside the little fat tile. And then, but then also, okay. So, and, but then it's also true that but you can train them to go either way, and same same goes. That every, that at every level they use the same rule. They, they only need to be trained once. For doing the for doing the process on one layer of the tile, and every construction worker learns the same rule, goes out to their part of the tiling, and then at every layer they use that same rule that they learned once upon a time, you know, in school. They get to use that same rule. It's it's a, so so. What I mean to say is that yeah, I think I have confused the matter by not by not fully labeling the tiles here, so it makes it look so. But what I mean what I mean to say is that if I had fully labeled the tiles. What you would see is that on both the purple tiles and the pink tiles, there some of the edges have single arrows, some of them have double arrows, is the kind of most standard notation, um, and and so what you'll see is so so if this was fully labeled, you would see that on all four of these edges there would be you know two of them would be labeled with single arrows, two of them would be labeled with double arrows, and what you would have learned in school was that if I see a fat tiling. You know, I figure out which which end is the front end of the tiling by looking at the arrows, and then once I know which end is the front end, I know how to split it up into smaller guys, and how to label those smaller guys with that same pattern of single and double arrows, so that then the next day we can go and do the same thing and, and, and use the exact same rule to, to to make an even more refined tiling. Yeah. So yes, so I think I may be I think I unfortunately made this unnecessarily complicated, but 
but the, the, the message that I want to get across is that there is an actual fundamental distinction here in terms of aperiodic tiles, like the Penrose tiling versus periodic tiles, which is that this black tiling really fundamentally, because of its translation symmetry, does not know what higher level tiling it came from. Whereas the pink tiling here not only knows it came from the purple tiling, it knows what much coarser tiling it came from a thousand generations up. It all, that, all that information is already encoded in, in the pink tiling. Yeah. So a quick question regarding the translation because it seems like if these uh, like green patterns and pink patterns are can be thought of kind of uh, wall patterns, if I'm saying some word and don't understand it. And what, what patterns did you say? Wall, like thin patterns and thick patterns. The, these uh, thin and thick, you mean? As in graph, mm -hmm. like graph thin, graph and thick. Yeah. The, the the pink and the, the pink and the purple you mean? Yeah, yeah. Kind so of, yeah. It's yeah, kind so, of. So in this They're not exactly dual, but yeah, kind of. Okay. So what I'm more interested in thinking is if we can portray and find grading as these others. And I because what you're saying that you have to say that portraying and find grading here is bijective, so you can go all the way back and forth. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the other ones it's not bijective. So the on fine grading is like you can it's like a Exactly. It's a one way, it's a exactly. Mm -hmm. Somehow you lose information when you go this way, but and then that you then cannot regain and, and, and go back the other okay, way. So you can you can go from the purple one to another. You, you can go a thousand one, layers up and then come right back down and get to the same guy without any memory. You know, just just using the local local rules. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, okay. So um, now before I talk before I tell you about the uh, uh, how this what, what this all has to do with hyperbolic space, let me. Uh, introduce you to this uh, uh, a little bit about how, how these regular tessellations work and the sort of notation for describing them, which sh this Schlafly notation, actually I'm a little worried I left out an L before the A here, maybe it's the Schlafly notation, sorry about that, sorry about the typo. Um, okay, so, so, so in this notation, for a, for a tiling of a two-dimensional space, you, you call it a PQ tiling, and what that means is that you have regular, it's made of regular p-gons, Three gone would be a triangle, an equilateral triangle, Q of which meet at every vertex. Okay, so so if you have tilings of the sphere, so tilings that uh, yeah, co cover the cover the two-dimensional sphere, uh, so th th those are the famous platonic solids. Okay, and so in this Schlafly notation, the, the tetrahedron here would be the three three because it's the, the, the faces are triangles and three triangles. This three means the faces are triangles. This three means three of them meet at every vertex. There's the octahedron, so the faces are triangles. Four of them meet at every vertex. The cube would be four or three, meaning the faces are squares. Three of them meet at every vertex. And then we have the icosahedron and the dodecahedron. Okay, and the thing that makes these tilings cur positively curved, form, you know, cover a positively curved space, is that this quantity one over p plus one over q is less. Is, excuse me, greater than a half. Check that these are the only five cases where, 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 where that is satisfied. If one over p plus one over q is equal to a half, then they lie perfectly flat. And so you have the three cases you know and love that satisfy that property: the square tiling, the triangular tiling, and the hexagonal tiling. But then, if one over p plus one over q is less than a half, those still form perfectly good regular tessellations. It's just that they don't lie. They don't, they, don't, they don't positively curve, they don't lie flat, they, they have to live in negatively curved hyperbolic space, uh, H2, so E2 here is the, is the completed space. And so here are two examples, the 7-3 tiling, where so we have heptagons here, three of them meeting at every vertex, or here's the 5-4 tiling, where pentagons, where four of them meet at every vertex. Uh, but there's an infinite number of examples. The, 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 the first two cases, I've shown all the examples, but then the hyperbolic case, is just everything else, all the other infinite set of possibilities, octagons that meet nine at every vertex, et cetera. Okay, so this uh, this the thing that we had pointed out in our in our paper in in 2020, and this uh, uh, that I referred to earlier was just the following interesting fact. So, okay, let me start with a bit of notation here. Um, so so here's how this all relates to quasi crystals. Um, uh, so suppose I have this dark gray region, S, uh, I want to introduce a notation for labeling the boundary of that region. Okay, so I'll do it as follows. I'll, I'll, make, I'll, cut, I'll, I'll make a cut around the, the, the region, 
and then uh, the brown line here, and then I, I'll look at every polygon that gets cut by that line, and I'll look at how many of its vertices are interior to the cut, and I'll label it by that number. Okay, so, 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 so in, for example, in this polygon, there's one, two, three of its vertices are interior, so I've called it a three, but with this polygon, only two of its vertices, one, two, are interior to the cut, so I've called it two. Over here, this one has four of its vertices inside the cut, so it's a four. Okay, so that, 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 that's a way of, of, of describing the geometry of the boundary of this region, tra just translating it into a string of numbers. Okay, and then now let's do the following. Let's play the following game. Let's imagine we start with a region, a smaller region, like this region S, and then I'm just gonna grow it by just adjoining to this, re to this region S all of the tilings here, that all of the tiles that touch it. Okay, so I'll just grow it to this larger region S prime, which includes one more layer of just tiles. And then I, I can imagine using the rule I just described to label the boundary of the smaller region and label the boundary of the larger region. And what you notice when you do this is that the string that, 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 that surrounded the smaller region is related to the string that surrounds the, the next larger region by a simple substitution rule. Every time you had a two in the first string, uh, you get a two, two, three in this larger, uh, on this larger boundary. And every time you had a three on the earlier string, you get a two, three on the larger boundary. And so you get, a, you get exactly an, a one-dimensional analog of the inflation rule that turns out to generate um, an aperiodic tiling, like the Penrose tiling, that has exactly this property that we were just mentioning, that, it, that, there, that there's not only a unique inflation rule for going in this direction, but then there's a unique local rule for, for going backwards in the other direction. Um, and what I wanna, uh, okay. Uh, so now let's, uh, before going up to see how things work in higher dimensions, because the, the, the story continues, basically the, the, there, is this, there is this general fact, it turns out, about, about aperiodic, about tessellations of negatively curved spaces that they have this property that that when you that that uh, that 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 that, that, if you, that if that if you, that if you cut the tiling at any point and then grow it by a layer uh, that the that the next layer is related to the previous one by by this sort of inflation rule that that uh, has this Penrose like quality that you can locally grow in either so direction what, what what was the rule for growing your cut is that just a, a simple scaling, or how does so? The, the rule that I use to grow the cut here is that I I I, I I I I start my initial I start with my initial patch, and then every tile that touches the patch, I I I add to the next layer. Okay, so those tiles are what I've added. If you see what I mean. Yeah, I, I mean I mean this this squiggly line cut though, I, it, it's just not clear to me how that oh, uh, is related yeah. to, like, like, like you just, like, because before you just said, okay, let's suppose I draw some line that encompasses my region, and then I count the vertices, like, what's so, the rule so, for growing? So, 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 uh, so the, 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 in the next layer, I'm going to include these, these guys, and the, the line that I'm going to draw is the line that cuts through the exactly those same tiles that I'll be adding to get to the next layer. So that's, I'm gonna, yeah. Oh, so it wasn't some kind of arbitrary. No, sorry, sorry. I, in fact, I think I made a mistake on the previous slide where I, where I, where I didn't quite follow as accurately and I oh. worried I was gonna confuse someone. And uh, I did. Uh, sorry about that. So yes, sorry. So it only, it, exactly, it only, it only works if you, uh, if, you, if, you, if you label it that way. Um, okay. So uh, now to, to, to just briefly uh, give an example of how things work in higher dimensions, let me first explain how the Schlafly notation goes to higher dimensions. So imagine, um, um, imagine we now go up to three-dimensional Euclidean space, then there's a famous, you know, there's, there's only one regular tessellation of three-dimensional Euclidean space, which is the, the one you naturally think of by cubes, stacking cubes. Um, so in the Schlafly notation, that would now because now we're in three dimensions, the Schlafly notation has four num has, has three numbers here, and the cube, the, the tessellation of 3D Euclidean space by cubes would be four, three, four. Here, the, now you're supposed to read this that the four, three is the symbol for a, for a 
cube. So that's, the, that's saying that every cell is a cube. And this four, you know, in the previous, in two dimensions, the final digit said how many cells surround each vertex. Now this four tells you how many cells surround each edge. So, so, it, so, so the tessellation by cube, each cell is a cube, and four of them surround every edge. By the way, you can see from this notation that this tiling is self-dual because the dual of any tiling, so it's any the, the, the new tiling that you get by swapping the vertices and the faces of the tiles uh, of, the, uh, of, of the tessellation, is, 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 uh, uh, is just taking is just what you get by swapping the numbers left to right. Okay, but so again, you, in, in addition to tilings of flat space, there's the tilings of the three-dimensional positively curved sphere, or there's tilings of uh, three-dimensional negatively curved hyperbolic space. So the most beautiful uh, tessellation of three-dimensional hyper hyperbolic space is this one, this self-dual tiling by icosahedra. So this is, uh, the cells are icosahedra, and 12 of them are meeting at every vertex, and here's some heroic Wikipedians uh, uh, attempt to, 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 to uh, visualize it. Um, so now, uh, how, how to deal with this case? Um, well, so imagine we took this tessellation and we, we started with a finite seed of, of icosahedra, or maybe we just took this tessellation, we cracked it along some surface. We cracked it so that some of the icosahedra lie above the crack and some of them lie uh, below or the boundary, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so then, the, uh, that, that surface, if you look down on the exposed surface of icosahedra, well, because all the faces of the icosahedra are all triangles, you'll get some bumpy triangulated surface. Now, I, I couldn't draw a bumpy triangulated surface, so I gave this artificial intelligence uh, image generator, Dali, the phrase bumpy triangulated surface, and it gave me back this picture. I was pretty impressed by it. Um, so anyway, that's actually <laughs> very helpful. Um, uh, but okay, so, and then the other thing is that because, you know, from the notation 353, three, there's only three um, icosahedra surrounding each edge. So that tells you that there's, there's actually only two types of exposed edge. There's either the exposed edge where two icosahedra meet in the previous layer and, and the edge bumps out. Uh, or, oh, sorry, I said that backwards. There's the, there's, the, there's the edge where two icosahedra meet, uh, so the edge, which is a valley where the edge bumps inward, or where you're just looking at the exposed edge of the single icosahedron, in which case the edge bumps out toward you if you're looking down at the exposed surface. Um, and so to make it a little bit easier to encode, so something to, to make it into something I can draw, I'm gonna change notation here. So I'm gonna draw all the bump, the edges that bump out as solid lines and the edges, the valleys that, that bump into the surface as dotted lines. Okay, and then I can show you a bit of what this tessellation actually looks like. So here's the black the the black, the black solid and uh, dotted lines on the bottom here are you know, a first layer, a patch of the first layer of this exposed tiling, and then the red solid and uh, dashed lines are, are the new layer that I get when I add one more layer of icosahedra on top of it. And it looks it's super complicated and you have to distort it badly to get it to fit in a flat plane. But when you uh, actually uh, uh, think about what's going on, it turns out that it's really, things are, things are not so complicated after all, actually. It turns out there's really only sort of three different types of vertices that are appearing in, in a given surface. This, this, this is what the surface looks like near a vertex where you're looking at a single exposed icosahedron. This is what the vertex looks like where you're looking at three icosahedra three exposed icosahedra that meet at the vertex, and this is where you have four exposed icosahedra that meet at the vertex. And for each case, you can figure out what the next, uh, sorry, I drew, I drew it as red on the previous picture, but the green lines now show what the next layer up looks like. And so it turns out that there is some simple, in fact, someone mentioned duality, and here it really is the case that, that the, let me see, I, 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 I should have dusted myself off about this before, so it's, Okay, yeah, I think it's the, I'm gonna screw it up if I try to say it on the fly, never mind. So, uh, so, but the bottom line is that, so uh, I had had a, um, 
In that 2020 paper, I had conjectured, based on various hints, that actually that the surfaces that you would get here would secretly be equivalent to the honest to God Penrose tiling, not just like the Penrose tiling, but actually really equivalent to the Penrose tiling. And then we told this conjecture to Penrose, who said he had that we were not the originators of the conjecture. He's according to him, he had had a conversation, you know, he has this crazy good memory. He has this brother, by the way, who's a ch chess champion, who he who he said, when I said he had a very good memory, he said, Well, my brother has is the one with a really good memory. He remembers every move of every game he's ever played his whole life, which is, apparently is not a joke. But anyway, so so he remembered this particular conversation that he had with Thurston in like the 1970s where Thurston said the same thing. But uh, so anyway, apparently it's his conjecture. Anyway, it turns out not quite to be right. Uh, so so the, um, it's very close to being right in the sense that you can find the substitution matrix that represents the rules for, you know, every time you have a certain tile of this type, how many tiles of the various types do you, do, you, do you get in the next layer above it? That, 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 that can be represented by a matrix with integer entries. And it turns out that the substitution matrix you get is exactly the same as the one for the, for, 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 for the Penrose tiling. That's actually the two sets of the Penrose tiling, if you, two inflations of the Penrose tiling. Um, but if you think about it harder, maybe for the, maybe I won't, you can show it, it, it just can't be actually equivalent to the Penrose tiling because, uh, and the, the actual Penrose tiling, when you do two inflations, it looks like it's been rotated by 180 degrees, whereas in this tiling, uh, it doesn't. So, so it's some new tiling, which only appears in hyperbolic space, um, very much like the Penrose tiling, but it's just some new thing that, that you don't find in flat space. And that, yeah. Right, so to get this, so do you have to touch the uh, 3D hyperbolic space along, uh, I don't know what it's called in 3D, but like the flat, in, in the yeah. Poincaré disk, well, my first question is, in the Poincaré disk, do you get this quadratic thing that you can cut it along like with the geodesic? So and in the 3D case, you get it along with the, the flat surface. Uh, it's a subtle thing, but yes. So actually, this is this is one of the, um, you know, one way to think about it is that if you, if you, you know, there was an early slide where I was explaining how you can get the Penrose tiling by starting from a finite set of tiles and then iterating and only in the limit of infinite iterations do you get the actual infinite Penrose tiling. So you know, one, one way to do it is to start with, any, it turns out if you start with any finite seed here, um, and then, but then, but then, but then grow it uh, in the limit that you've grown it infinitely many layers, you get, you get a, a version of this tiling. Um, but there's a better way to say it, which is basically what you're referring to, that that uh, topologically, really, what it's what 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 you're cutting along are so-called horospheres or flat slices through 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 three-dimensional hyperbolic space. It's just that it's actually a very wiggly. It's it's it's, it's not. Um, yeah, you, you 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 it's it's not that you can actually geometrically cut. In fact, Penrose. This is another thing is that Penrose had said that Thurston had had thought. Again, this is all hearsay from Penrose, but that you could actually take certain special horosphere slices through this tiling and get the Penrose tiling. Yeah. That, that, as far as we know, is not true. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, what's the, um, um, yeah, but, but, in, but, but, but what you can, but, 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 but there, but there, are, but there are cuts that are, that are, um, that topologically yeah. just, just infinite, 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 uh, flat, topologically just infinite, uh, yeah, slices that go on forever and that, that wiggle up and down around yeah. the horosphere. Okay. And, likewise for the and you can follow them arbi then arbitrarily far back. They, 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 they form a foliation then of okay. these, of, these uh, of hyperbolic space. And likewise in the point where this, you can like around horocycles. Exactly. Of which the boundary is the one, which is the horocycle at infinity. Oh, the boundary is the horocycle at infinity, right. So, so exactly, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. with, with this different tiling that you find, does it require this single line, double line labeling that the Penrose tiling requires, or? Uh, well, actually, it's a good question. I, we, we have, you know, we, we have, the, the way we've understood it is in terms of these three tiles, um, and uh, they, they don't, mm, so, We have it in terms of a different set of tiles, so it doesn't have this sort of edge edge business. Um, but it is still the case. So we, we there's some extra you, labeling one has to do. Or? 
Well, no, not in this case. No, no. Here, here you have all the information you need to start to, 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 to these pictures here uh, have everything you really are, are, are the full information with no missing no missing labels. And so that the, these let you look at any layer and either then go from go from the green layer to the black layer or vice versa. Would be the better for the construction. I guess so. Yes, uh, but uh, yes, but again, but I think uh, again, I, I I made it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but but the part what I, I also want to emphasize that conceptually speaking, they're 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 the, they're the same. I mean, they they both they both have locally all the information you need to go to get both of those. Um, okay, so let's see. Is there anything else I want to say about this? Uh, I guess not. Just to say that. Uh, so, so I, how am I? Oh well, I okay. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm way behind where I thought I was, but so we so uh, where where I uh, was imagining, but that's okay. That's great. Uh, um, uh, maybe I. So I was going to stop the first part here and say that. Uh, you know. So there are these new quasi crystals that appear in hyperbolic space. I think from a mathematical standpoint, there's a lot still. That's interesting to explore about these guys. Uh, we've only really constructed one example in three-dimensional hyperbolic space. Uh, yeah, I think I think it would be I think it would be interesting to 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 uh, sort of understand better what's going on with with, with, with all the others and, and and even with this one. If we there's a lot that we still don't understand about it. And then just also that it's that that uh, I think that there's this. It's at the beginning of this interesting um, story of trying to find. You know, people have been getting closer to over the, over the past few years, well, who, who knows, they're, 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 they've been, they're, they've been, there's been an effort which has not yet fully succeeded to give a discrete formulation of holography of the ADS DSD correspondence relating, you know, a, a discrete system living in the bulk to a discrete system living on the boundary um, that, uh, so that the actual, you know, Partition functions match, and so 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 that there's an actual duality at, at, at the same level uh, uh, as 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 an ABS DSD. Um, mm, so we're not there yet, but uh, uh, and uh, but I, I think that the that 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 will have to do somehow that the, that the, that the, that the boundary system will have to be seems likely to be some sort of system that's defined on one of these on one of these. Uh, Quasi crystals uh, in hyperbolic space, and uh, yeah, it'll just be it'll just be an interesting bit of physics to, to understand what things were like on this. Because we're at the end of time, I think I won't say anything about this. I'm just maybe trying to see if I could say one thing that would take one minute. Um, you know, maybe in brief, very briefly. Here, I'll, can I give the one minute version of this? So the one minute version of this part of the talk is that um, there's a beautiful theory of reflection groups due to Coxeter. A great way to get tilings like the Penrose tiling, which actually was pioneered by Robert Moody here at, at, at Alberta. Uh, by the way, I should mention Robert Mer Moody made a lot of his most important and uh, deepest uh, contributions about these quasi-periodic tilings, um, is to work with a lattice that has a lot of reflection symmetry and then to take a particular special element of the reflection group called the Coxeter element, and its eigenspaces define these, these very symmetrical, irrational slices which you can then use to define the lower dimensional Penrose tilings, or cousins of the Penrose tiling. So for example, here are four, four examples that have eight-fold symmetry, and here are the, here are the 12 examples that have, or six examples with, with 12-fold symmetry. Um, but there's also these very beautiful, special, even self-dual lattices in, in any, the, these, these lattices only exist when the number of space minus time dimensions is a multiple of Eight, and but all the most remarkable lattices known to humankind are 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 in these examples. So in the Euclidean signature, this the first example is the E8 lattice, and then there's two more in 16 dimensions, and then when you get to 24 dimensions, you get the Leaf's lattice, which is really the coolest lattice that's ever been found. But then also in space-time, in Minkowski space, if the number of space minus time dimensions is equal to a multiple of eight, you also have lattices like this. So the first non-trivial example occurs in nine plus one dimensions. So it's this lattice two, nine comma one. And uh, so what we have uh, noticed is that you can do the same thing here. You can define the Coxeter element and its eigenspaces 
and they define three very beautiful, uh, four very beautiful inequivalent copies, irrational slices of three plus one dimensional Minkowski space, cutting through this nine comma one lattice. The nine comma one lattice is interesting because in string theory, there's this paper by Greg Moore that pointed out that actually the most symmetric toroidal compactification of the superstring is when you take all 10 dimensions of the of superstring theory and compactify all of them on this lattice by, by modding out Minkowski space by this lattice. Um, and he dismisses this as unphysical because he says, oh, well, you know, it has closed time like curves, and so you know, it, this wouldn't make sense physically, but it's interesting mathematically that it's the most symmetrical structure. But the interesting thing is that if you have this three, one of the, if you suppose, just suppose for a moment that we lived on one of these three plus one dimensional Minkowski slices that irrationally cuts through this lattice. Well then, even though for a 10 dimensional observer, an observer who could roam in 10 dimensions, if you, if you compactify all 10 dimensions, you can, you have closed time like curves in the time direction, and so you could go backward in time and have all sorts of paradoxes. If you're restricted to the three plus one dimensional lattice, you know, it never intersects itself. It, 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 it's like this, it's like this guy. It wraps around and around and around, but because of its irrational slope, it never intersects itself. It densely covers the 10 dimensional surface, but it itself goes on forever. So we could be living on a three dimensional, three plus one dimensional Minkowski space that's infinitely large, goes on forever, looks just like what we see, but secretly could be wrapped up in one of these 10 dimensional uh, uh, toruses. And the crazy part of the talk was a bit of numerology suggesting that maybe that uh, could help explain this puzzling fact, which is that the three dimensional numbers appearing in the standard model of particle physics coupled to gravity are stupendously different from one another. But an interesting thing is that they're related to one another by, for some reason, that, that the electroweak scale is the geometric mean of the Planck scale and the vacuum energy scale. And that, the argument was supposed to be that this maybe gives a, gives a picture where that doesn't seem so crazy, but uh, it probably is crazy, don't get me wrong, I just thought it was fun to mention. But anyway, so I'll let me stop there. That was more than a one minute summary. So I apologize for running over and thank you very much for listening to this.